Welcome everyone. My name is Melissa Bostrom. I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Professional Development in the Graduate School and I'm delighted to all, uh, welcome all of you to this first in a series of three panel discussions uh, uh, as part of the Academic Job Search Series and these are focused on the tenure track faculty positions and the application interview and negotiation process. So today's panel is on specifically the application package and we're delighted to feature three experts who have bring the perspective of their own search committee and service and expertise um, to the panel discussion today. Um, let me begin by introducing um, Keisha Cutright, who is Associate Professor of Marketing in the Fuqua School of Business here at Duke. She received her PhD from Duke at Fuqua in 2011. Um, she went away for a little while and was a faculty member at the Wharton School at Penn, um, and then starting in 2016, returned to Duke. She just could not resist, the, I would, should I say, the devil's song <laughs> luring her back. <laughs> um, next to Keisha is Amy Johnson, who is Executive Director of the Elon Core Curriculum and Associate Professor of History and Geography at Elon University. Um, she also received her PhD from Duke University, so we're delighted to be able to welcome her back to the campus. And then uh, to her left is David Long, who is Dean and Department Head of Arts and Sciences and University Transfer at Durham Technical Community College. Um, he holds a PhD in, um, is it history, is that right? From uh, UNC Chapel Hill. But I, I think it's not basketball season, so it's safe for us to say <laughs> that in this room. And so we're delighted that you made the trip to represent um, a community college perspective as part of this uh, discussion. So just a quick logistical note about how this is gonna work. I've gone ahead and shared a number of questions with our panelists ahead of time that represent some concerns or questions that were shared as part of the registration process. And I wanna make sure that we, we kind of get to those core questions. Um, as a priority. Happy to take follow-up questions from the audience as we go. Um, and then I do want to note that we're going to wrap up absolutely no later than 4.15 so that there's some time for one-on-one -on -one conversation at the end of today's conversation. Okay, so that's how things will go today. So to start out, um, I've asked each of our panelists, and I'll start this time with Keisha since she's at the front of the line, <laughs> to describe the balance of faculty responsibilities in terms of research, teaching, and service um, at your institution in your role, and then what do you look for in new faculty to be a good fit um, with that balance? Yeah, so I think there is a bit of a difference in terms of the balance of responsibility versus what you're ultimately rewarded for here, particularly at Duke. So at the end of the day, what we'll look for in terms of rewarding you is almost 100% the research um, and what you're able to publish. In real life, your actual responsibilities, I would say it's probably two-thirds of the research, and then a third of that is the teaching piece. We don't expect much of you at all from a service perspective, uh, particularly those first couple of years. You may have to kind of meet with speakers who come, invite speakers, but that's usually the extent of it. We try to keep the service requirements pretty low here and at Wharton. I'll talk kind of about those perspectives. Uh, usually we try to stack your teaching in one semester so that you can truly feel like two-thirds of the time you can focus on research and then one-third you're kind of focusing on teaching, uh, which is certainly a privilege and not the case, obviously, across all schools, uh, even within the business school. Uh, but they just try to isolate it such that it's, you get a chance to really focus on your research for some portion of the year. I would say in terms of what we look for to see whether or not um, people will ultimately be able to successfully kind of reach the, the tenure requirements, which again is all based on the research, is looking to see if you've published anything yet, and that's usually kind of um, the way that people will kind of flip through the stacks of applications that come in. Um, uh, I think we often say like, oh, we just go through the research, it's a good research, but I think uh, from a very honest perspective, it's the filtering mechanism is first, have you published anything yet? And so then we'll kind of look at, all right, what well, was published, things yet, and then we'll look to say, okay, do we like these papers that have been published and the working papers? So we then do read the papers and get into it, and I think we can be honest in saying, we really do care about the quality of the research, um, but there's that first kind of filtering mechanism where we say, have you published yet? And then we get into it. So, not the same, um, at all. Elon is a teaching school. Um, 
when we said that. I, I, we, we teach six classes a year. Um, so you'll have usually um, a 3-1-2 or a 3-3 or a 2-1-3, however you want to do it, but six classes in a year. Um, new faculty, uh, the, the way that departments will try to help you is to have you have at least multiple, like the same couple of, of preps, but you will probably have three or four unique classes in a year. Um, you get a lot of support for developing these classes. There's a lot of support around teaching. Um, we're number two in the country in undergraduate teaching, and so that's the thing that we, we look for the most. Um, but um, when we're looking at applications, we are looking to see, um, you know, have you taught, have you mentored, is this your, your passion, is your passion working with students, and also, have you published something? It's not probably not the same in terms of quality or quantity, um, but we wouldn't accept any candidate that hasn't done something or has something in the works. Um, depending on, like if you're just coming out of grad school and this is your first um, teaching, your, your first position, you know, if you have something that's out under review, like that's acceptable, and you have some conference presentations, but absolutely nothing in that scholarship field wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. Um, so at Elon, it is teaching first, scholarship second, and then service. Um, but service is a big part of what we do. Um, faculty have a large role in, in the administration of the, of the institution. And so new faculty are, are usually doing work in the department. Um, and what that looks like kind of depends on what the needs are. Um, Um, it depends on what the, the needs are at that time, but we, you know, if there's um, alumni grants and money needs to be dispersed or that sort of thing, we, you know, anything in the department is usually where, where our new faculty start. Um, so when we are looking at a candidate, when we get the application material, we're looking at somebody who is um, passionate about undergraduate, working with undergraduate students, so teaching um, and mentoring, that has an active scholarship um, but recognizing that with six classes you're not going to be able to produce a book a year unless you're super person um, that's just not how we're set up and then understanding that you will have to do service across the university at some point in order to be tenured so I think we're kind of on a continuum <laughs> <laughs> um, I, might, I might start my response by telling a story we're actually um, we're partnering with Tim Tyson for the South and Black and White course. It's a community course that brings together Duke students, Carolina students, State, Central, Durham Tech students. Uh, there was a person at the UNC History Department, a graduate student, who was about to go on the job market, who was a TA for the South and Black and White a couple years ago. And I remember she came up to me and said, well, I'm thinking about applying to Tidewater Community College in Virginia. And what advice do you have for me? And I said, don't talk about your research. And, uh, and she was kind of shocked when I, when I said that. But the fact of the matter is, community colleges are about teaching. Um, when we interview applicants, we see the application um, packet. Um, if, if there is a distinct interest in research, and that's the thing that the person is passionate about and wants to do, that's great. I mean, that's fine. But it's not something that we're looking for at a community college. You know, typically speaking, you'll be teaching uh, five classes in a semester. Uh, so it's, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy teaching load. And the reward is um, it pays well enough. It pays you know, rel relatively well compared to small uh, four-year liberal arts schools. Um, but the payback is really that you enjoy teaching. So the people who come to, to Durham Tech and um, thrive are, are people who want to teach first and foremost. A lot of us have published, I've got peer-reviewed articles, a lot of other faculty members do. We have people with degrees from Stanford and Cornell and UC Berkeley and Duke and Carolina. So you know, we come from research backgrounds, but the people who come and stay, and our faculty you know, tend to come and stay, are the people who like to teach. So don't mention your research if you become interested in community college. Um, 
and you're, you're going into the application process, you could mention it as a way to you enhance your, your teaching, I guess. And then I guess I interpreted service a little bit differently. Um, yes, faculty members are involved with committees, with search committees. Um, I was talking to Amy a little bit earlier about how we're shifting to a meta-major framework and the faculty is actually doing that work. Um, but I also thought about service in terms of community service. Was that what the question? Um, I know that at Chapel Hill, community service is, is required of their faculty. It's one of the three major focuses. Um, it's encouraged at Durham Tech, but quite honestly, our community service is, is our teaching to some extent. Um, because we do serve a lot of first generation students, a lot of people who come from under resourced backgrounds, and our job is to give people opportunities who didn't have them otherwise. I'm going to start the next question with Amy. So, I think um, those of you who are preparing application packages right now know that there, there used to be just a cover letter and a CV, and then over time we've added all these additional materials, and um, it's teaching statement, um, diversity and inclusion statement, um, research statement, um, and probably you know a couple others that are out there as well. Can you talk to us in your particular institutions about in what order you look at those materials? Um, what do you use for kind of initial screening, and then what do you kind of dig down deeper into? And what insights might that process have for folks who are on the other end writing those materials? That's interesting. We just hired an Africanist, and I was uh, an Africanist historian, and I was um, on that search committee. Um, you did say to start with me. Uh, you know, okay, um, so we first and foremost we were looking. The first thing that we're looking for in that initial paragraph is, can you do the job that we have advertised? Right. So we were looking for an Africanist historian who um, studied particularly West Africa. We were looking for somebody who did modern stuff. People who did South Africa and Tanzania and all those places. It was really great, but they weren't. You know, we we didn't focus on them. They didn't get tossed, but we didn't focus on them right away. We really went to that pool of people that, that said that this is what they do. Um, at our institution, we don't ask for a bunch of separate documents. Um, so your, your statement about how you engage diversity, equity, and inclusion, how you incorporate um, your research, you know, how you see yourself functioning in our in our university setting, it's all part of your cover letter. Um, so we don't ask for like your teaching philosophy as a separate document from your CV. Um, so that's the first thing we, we look at. Can you do the job that we've asked you to do? Then next we're looking at um, do you have experience either teaching or mentoring undergraduates and do you have a research trajectory? Um, and the order of those two doesn't actually matter, um, but coming from an R1, I would probably start with your research trajectory. Um, so when I applied to Elon, that's what I started with, and it was successful, so do what I did. Um, so that that was you know the next part of it. Um, and then the final part that I think gets left out, and particularly if you're looking at smaller schools or if you're in a discipline that is currently losing majors is to be really clear about how you can connect with the rest of the university so how you can see yourself fitting into other pieces um, so whether that's teaching WGSS or African and African American studies or um, if you think you might want to to work with students in leadership Showing that you can see yourself in multiple places around the university is always helpful because particularly at universities like Elon, we're looking for people who are triple threats or quadruple threats or however much you can be. So we're looking for people who can teach, who have a research agenda, but who can clearly see themselves in lots of different teaching environments and service environments. Quick clarification, what's a WGSS Sorry, it wasn't in gender sexuality studies. Sorry, you don't all know my acronyms. Um, in most general terms, my answer is just like yours. You know, we look for evidence that somebody wants to do what we need done. And, and more specifically, understands who we are. Mm -hmm and wants to teach specifically at Durham Tech. And it goes beyond you know, just wanting to teach at a community college. They understand Durham Tech. 
Um, a lot of people who are applying from elsewhere um, will do their research. You know, they go to the website, they'll see what our offerings are, they'll see, they'll see what our mission statement is. And um, when they refer to that, that gives us a sense, sense that, that you know, they're serious. They're not just carpet bombing, as I put it. I mean, I know that sometimes people just need a job and they apply for everything. Um, but when that's obvious in your application, it's problematic. Um, and so what, what are we looking for people to do? We're looking for people who teach. So again, you want to emphasize that you've taught, but you also want to emphasize that you've taught in a lot of different kinds of environments. Uh, uh, if you've taught many, many different fields and subjects, that's, that's a plus too. I think by the time I became permanent, I taught almost a dozen different courses, and that was helpful. Um, but we also want to see that you can navigate challenging academic environments. So our classes, will include across campus people from 95 different countries, uh, people who are non-native English speakers, people who are first generation college students, people who are homeless, uh, veterans, veterans with PTSD, older learners, high school students. I mean, they're, they're coming at you from all sorts of directions. So we want to see some evidence that, that the applicant has navigated an environment like that. And beyond that, navigated it and liked it and got energy from it. Because I, I know for what, if I look at my graduate student core, a, a cohort, the people who were working on the doctorates with me, or I think eight of us that finished, um, I can tell you which ones would be very unhappy about that. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you which ones would be happy there, and I'm one of them. So it's, it's, it's a matter of fit, right, I think, with any job search. Is this, is this a good fit? So um, for a community college, you want to do your research for, for that specific institution, but you also want to be able to navigate challenging environments and get energy from it, um, and then teaching. You know, if that's what you want to do, a community college is, is, uh, is a good target uh, school for you. So in terms of the order in which we look at documents and how we prioritize them, I would say that generally, for better or worse, we trust our own judgments of your past more than anyone else's. So we look first at your Vita to say, what have you done? What have you done in terms of research? What have you done in terms of teaching? Um, do you look like a team player? Is there anything that we can kind of gather for ourselves from your Vita? And we kind of say, all right, we trust ourselves to make some judgments based on that. Then next, we trust our colleagues, so then we look at recommendation letters, and we'll look and see, like, of the people that we know usually give us honest perspectives about their students, what are they actually saying? And we wait in our minds, who are the people who always say nice things, who are the people who are usually honest, and we make judgments based on how we look at those recommendation letters, based on their reputation for letters. Um, and so we trust them second. And then third, we would trust the applicant. So then we would look at your letters and how you frame yourself with respect to your research and your teaching and say, all right, given our specific needs this year, do they think that they can do the job that we're asking them to do? Um, so I would say that's probably a little bit of priority in which we kind of get down to it. Eventually, we see all of the materials. I think we just assign different weights to the different pieces of the different ones. Yeah, like we actually already answered question three that's on your list, which is a question about differentiating those materials. So I want to jump ahead to question number four. Um, and I think it's always David has already answered this question. Um, it's how are specific elements such as teaching experience and publication record weighted in determining which candidates will make it to interview stage? Um, is there anything you want to add about that, David? Well, you should remind me what question I was supposed to be responding to the last time I spoke. So maybe I'll circle back and talk about the order, you know, what, what sort of application materials we look at first, second, or third. Um, we have an automated ad, uh, administration system that collects applications called People Admin. I quite honestly don't know how common it is. Um, but that system will actually vet the applicants um, and see if they have the minimum academic credentials, that sort of thing. There'll be like three questions that the applicant has to answer correctly to get past um, that gatekeeper. Um, we get a lot of applications. We just um, hired for a full-time philosophy instructor 
we opened the application for three weeks. I think we got 66 applications. Uh, we had applicants from St. Petersburg, Russia, from Madrid, California, so all different directions. So we were looking at a pretty mixed pool. Um, I would agree that we don't weight letters of recommendation that heavily because the simple fact of the matter is you typically don't pick somebody to write those letters who's going to say something negative about you. Um, so it's really, uh, we, we ask for a, a cover letter, um, CD, uh, and, and transcripts. So it's a pretty basic package. Um, so so when, when we are looking for the, the elements of a good fit, um, sometimes we can glean that from the CD, but it really comes down to that cover letter. So you know, you know, we're talking about um, one or two pages to make your case and, and just be very direct. I like to teach. I, I enjoy navigating complicated populations, et cetera, et cetera. So if you had to put your emphasis on something, I, I would agree. We do um, probably cover letter CV and then supporting statement so in the order that it's here. Um, in terms of what weighs more, um, they're kind of equal, right? We, we're looking for somebody um, who is passionate about teaching um, and or mentoring. So, you know, if you have a, a, a CV and your CV is really research heavy, but in your cover letter you're telling us why you are so passionate about teaching, that's important and we'll, we'll give the resources to help you to be the teacher that you want to be. Um, so, so for us the cover letter is where you make your case. Um, we use the CV just to kind of get a sense of where your strengths are. Um, yeah, and then, and then the, the letters of recommendation, they, we read them. Um, we're usually reading them to find out if if your advisor or whoever it is that wrote this letter sees something in you that you haven't said in your CV or in your cover letter. And sometimes that happens. Um, even, not, and I don't mean negatively, but they may see you emerging in some particular field or having some special personality trait or something that you haven't talked about. And so those can be really illuminating, but we don't, unless they're like serious red flags that come up in your um, in your supporting document, your, your uh, letters of recommendation, they don't usually change anything. Um, they become more important when we get down to like 1A and 1B, like then, then those might become really important. And for us, I mean, research is number one, the teaching becomes number two, particularly if you have a specific hole that we're trying to fill. Uh, and then when it comes to teaching, we're not so much looking to see whether or not you have a passion for teaching as much as we're looking for, do you think you have the skill to do it? So do you have some evidence that you could actually teach the topic that we're looking for? And that would be great. But even then, um, so if you pass that bar, we're still not really looking to see so much about the evidence that you can teach well because we trust ourselves that when you come and present, we'll be able to judge whether or not you'll be a good teacher. Um, and so like the, the the passion piece, we don't pay as much attention to, um, for better or worse, and actually I think we should pay more attention to it, we don't. It's more about, do we think you have the skill to teach the topic? Um, and then can you, when you come and present, can you prove that? Anybody have any follow-up questions at this point about materials before we shift gears just a little bit? So I'm going to start with Keisha this time. Um, talk to us about who's competitive for faculty jobs at your institution. Do you hire folks coming straight out of PhD programs? Do you expect people to have done a postdoc or a teaching postdoc? What if candidates haven't had a lot of teaching experience in a PhD program? Do you expect you know kind of a, a visiting assistant professorship or some? some more teaching intensive experience for the teaching focused institutions, you know, what, what are the paths that you see kind of as patterns um, emerging of successful hires? Yeah, I think there are multiple paths. It just depends on the year and what our needs are. So there are some years where the dean's office says you can hire whomever you'd like, and so we're happy to take in folks who are coming straight from a PhD program. Um, 
our constraints come in when there's a specific teaching need that we need fulfilled or at a specific level. So if we know we need someone to come straight in to teach our MBA program, for example, uh, then we may be more likely to just go from our senior assistants, people who've had a job before or people who've had a postdoc, but people who just feel like they've been out there a little bit longer um, just based on the classroom need and what we think that we need to have kind of in front of our more senior students. But if we have openings at different levels and more of our kind of more junior student classes need to be fulfilled, then we're happy to take people right out of um, PhD programs, assuming they've shown evidence of being able to do research. So it's pretty open, just depending on, it, it follows a lot of kind of what we need from a teaching standpoint. That's the group of Maybe. We tend to mostly hire assistant professors. Um, our last two hires were straight out of graduate school. Our most recent hire, um, we made the offer in December, and he didn't get his PhD until April. So, so yes, we will hire people um, straight from from graduate school. Um, that said, people who have evidence of having taught before just usually have better letters you have more things to to point to um, but you know you're not you wouldn't be ex excluded um, at e um, yeah I think that's pretty much so for us it's, just, it's a mix we've we've hired uh, people straight out of graduate school but typically that's been when they attended the graduate school that, that had a teaching emphasis um, even, you know, the, even the PhD program, we want to see a teaching emphasis. Um, the, the hiring process at a community college is very different from a typical four-year institution. Typically at a four-year institution, if they hire somebody fixed term, they're basically sending the message that they're not going to hire you full-time, right? they're not going to give you tenure. Um, it's different at a community college because we do give preference to our adjuncts, and teaching part-time is uh, you know, a step, a step on the ladder. It, it's not always the case, but if we have a really good adjunct who has an established track record, those questions I mentioned earlier, earlier, do you like teaching? Can you manage this complicated educational environment? Well, those questions have been answered. So that they, they have a distinct advantage when they come in and they interview and they do their teaching demonstration. It doesn't always give them the job, but it certainly gives them the advantage. Do you currently have any graduate students who, or postdocs who are teaching at Durham Tech and adjuncting? Do, does anybody you know, do that to gain experience and get a foot in the door? Yeah, um, I've, I've had, it's, it's interesting because um, we had a lot of Duke graduate students as um, instructors at Durham Tech in part, um, I don't know if I should say this, but I think it's hard. I, I, at Duke, it seems like it's harder to become an instructor of record. Mm -hmm. at, when I was at Carolina, once you became AB, ABD, you were teaching all the time. You know, so I, I was able to get that experience. It seems like at Duke, typically it's a summer class. Or, mm -hmm. So a, a lot of Duke graduate students come to us just for the experience. They want to you know, fill out their CV. Um, Dan Tutora, Tutora mm -hmm. from years ago, mm -hmm. so he taught for us for a long time. We thought we were going to hire him full time, meeting up at Colby. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in any case, uh, it was a great experience for Dan. He, he liked us. Um, he had, you know, different opportunity in, in the end. But the bottom line, he was better prepared when we on the job market. You know, in any job interview, he, he has the flexibility to say not only you know, is he doing great research and, and you know, he's a thoughtful scholar, but he's also a very established teacher, and I was able to, you know, uh, well, I don't know, we just talked about how people don't look at recommendation <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, but I do think, I, I can't say this, you know, with more emphasis. If, if people are interested in teaching in community college, again, I, it's not for everybody. Um, but I really think the, the key is experience to actually do it and see what you like. Um, we have uh, uh, Maggie McDowell um, teaching with us now through the Humanities Unbounded Partnership, and uh, you know, she really sees.
seems to be thriving and enjoying it. I don't know if she'll be in a community college for the long term. But that's an example of somebody who experimented um, and found that she, she found the fit. Um, so yeah, coming straight out of graduate school doesn't disqualify you. We've had people apply who had tenure positions at other four year schools. We've had administrators apply. We, we see a lot of different things. And we, we're open to any good candidates, but actually teaching at a community college is a real benefit. So for this next question, I'm going to start with Amy. You said so there was a, a mention of red flags earlier in looking at the recommendation letters. Um, folks in the room are, are always wanting to avoid those kind of red flag moments to the extent they can. It's hard to avoid those in recommendation letters because you aren't privy to those. But in, in the other materials that candidates do have you know, control over, um, what are some things, some mistakes that we can warn the folks in the room about, um, help them avoid those kinds of mistakes in their own application packages? Can we start with me? Sure. <laughs> I'm throwing you under the bus. I need to think about this one. Well, I've already given you my, my greatest piece of advice. Don't, don't, don't mention your research. And that, that's overstatement. Just don't emphasize your research. Um, uh, I'm curious, it sounds like Fuqua has a teaching demonstration. Well, it's just the regular year. presentation, and we okay. just judge you. <laughs> okay, and this, I don't know, does he own it? Yeah, so we, we teaching, you know, you teach a class. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, the teaching demonstration for us is can be make or break. Mm -hmm. And definitely make sure that whatever you say is in an interview is congruent with what you display during the teaching demonstration. Um, I've, I've been in a room when somebody was off the charts in terms of the interview. The questions were great, they were very conversational, um, they, they were on point, um, and they seemed to be able to um, navigate the situation well, and they got to the teaching demonstration, and it was, uh, you know, crickets. <laughs> it was just, um, and, and sometimes it's a matter of somebody explaining, you know, I, I'm, dynamic teacher, I like kinetic learning, I like this, and then they'll present a PowerPoint and they'll read it. <laughs> um, so this, this may be stated the obvious, um, but if, if you do go to a, a job interview that has a teaching demonstration, make sure that you understand what's expected and that you, you have a very polished um, presentation uh, to offer the interview. I think I'm yeah. So, so as you were as you were talking, I was thinking that's exactly it. When when we're looking at application materials, the biggest red flag is when we're reading something and we realize very early on that you don't know us, right? Um, that you know if and it's not just whether or not you can do the job, but if you don't know that we are a teaching institution. So if you send a CV a cover letter and you're just talking about all the things that you plan to publish. Not with students, not in collaboration with other, but just you and your Carol typing away. That would be a really big red flag for us. Um, constant name dropping is is also a, a big red flag. So one of the beautiful things about being at at Duke, which is an R one, is that you're often working with the leaders in your field, and they have name recognition, and that's important. Um, but when we are looking at application material and you're spending more time talking about how great you are for having worked with Professor blah blah blah, that also comes across as a as a as a big red flag when we're when we're reading it. I think those are the two really big ones that encompass a lot of kinds of mistakes that people can make. So like if you are just kind of a, you know sending off applications to lots of different places. I would recommend to at least have one cover letter for research schools, one cover letter for teaching schools, you know, that, that kind of fit the, the broader genre um, or type of, of institution um, instead of just trying to have that one cover letter that you try to send out to all 15 positions or whatever it is. Um, because that is, when we look at something and we realize that you don't know anything about us, we, we don't make it through the first round. And make sure you get the names right. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> right. Like that happens from time to time. Halfway through, right. you'll see Colby College. Yeah, right. Like, well, <laughs> that's not who we are. Yeah, 
for free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't think of many red flags. It's, I mean, one is the obvious, don't be sloppy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if it's sloppy, I'm not interested in continuing. It's the second mm -hmm. would be uh, sometimes being too specific about what you want to do. So say that you want to teach a very specific kind of course. If you don't know that that's exactly what we need, then that kind of puts you in a box where we say, well, this is what this person wants to do and we can't offer that right now. So I think just showing that you're open to, to doing what they need you to do, I think is helpful. Yeah. So you may want to ask any follow-up questions at this point. Yeah. If earlier you mentioned the letters of recommendations and that there's this sort of through the grapevine you could know of some professors that are you know purported to write the better or more honest ones like how can you tell me how that chain of communication works it's more of I don't know that it's it's definitely not something that's kind of formalized. It's just kind of over time, like people, certain people in the field have a reputation of being harsher than others, and some people are always very nice. And we see lots of letters um, from professors when it comes to admitting PhD students, and then also when their students are on the market. And so you just start to see certain themes, and so within an area, so within the marketing department, we kind of all know whose letters are going to be the really nice letters. And it really just helps you figure out like how to read it. So if we know that one particularly mean person writes a really stellar letter, then it just gets a lot more attention from mm -hmm. us. And we're just kind of like, all right, let's dig in with a so-and-so who's never happy really <laughs> likes this person. Mm -hmm. So it's just more of kind of like, and it's not that having a nice person write your letter is a bad thing. That's totally fine. It's just that it stands out yeah. when there's someone who's really critical who says something positive about you. So you kind of pay attention to that um, within an area. But it's definitely been an, an informal, we're just noticing trends on like, where the new people and who they like. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have a question about um, basically coming from a place like Duke that's, you know, R1, R1 really research focused and a lot of people end up going to like really good schools, but if I wanted to go to like a community college, for example, or something that's more teaching focused, that doesn't necessarily, that maybe um, new Duke PhDs aren't always kind of um, as well trained for, aren't as interested in, um, how, how do you, what's kind of the best way to strike that balance of, you know, getting the experience you need and communicating that you're really serious about this, um, and maybe you know getting some experience adjuncting like you were talking about David but I also hear these kind of horror stories about kind of getting trapped as an adjunct and if you do it too long mm -hmm. like you won't be able to get out sort of thing mm -hmm. and then you and people read into that kind of negative right. um, negative things basically so um, I guess yeah how do you if you have advice about how to kind of strike that balance about showing you're serious and getting enough experience but not you know not kind of pigeonholing yourself into the agile world. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's, there's something to what you say about um, being trapped as an adjunct. I mean, if you, know, you see an application and a person's been an adjunct for 20 years, um, you know, you do start to ask questions. I, I think it's less of an issue. Um, um, what, in a community college hiring process, um, I, th it's, it, and I know you're, you're asking about how do you strike the balance, how do you make sure you're serious and still get the experience. Um, I, you know, I would encourage a graduate student to try every kind of teaching experience possible. You know, I went through Carolina, um, I went through the whole uh, you know, professional training to help me go into the job market, I had the elevator speech. And, learn all the things that you needed to apply to a, a tenure track institution. Um, I mentioned community colleges once, one of my professors, and I think he just sort of dismissed me and said, well, they're going to think you're arrogant. <laughs> and that was my training for um, community college. So basically what happens, I was, I was teaching 
a fixed term at Carolina, so I was teaching undergraduate seminars. Uh, of course, there was a mixed graduate student, undergraduate population. And I got a message through um, our listserv that Durham Tech was looking for somebody to teach an American history survey. I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. My sleep. Um, and my first question was, well, where's Durham Tech? <laughs> you know, I went, spent a lot of time in Chapel Hill. I'd never set foot in Durham Tech. I didn't know where it was. And that's because my bubble just didn't concern itself with community colleges. So what happened was I was hired at the last minute. I hit the ground running. I was actually teaching the same class at Chapel Hill and at Durham Tech at the same time. I had to alter it a little bit for Durham Tech. The goal was to get everybody at both institutions to the same point at the end, which I think I did. Um, but it was a great experience. And it, if I had been a different person that had different interests and I was applying for a different job later and I felt like, um, you know, I didn't want to mention one of my teaching experiences. I taught in a prison. I taught in the Smithfield Medium Correctional Facility. I mean, I've done everything. Um, it's easy enough to just put that off your CV. You know, it's not being dishonest. Um, but I think the bottom line is, is the reality is that if you, if you experience as many different settings as possible, it helps you make up your mind about what you're going to do. I think I've lost track of who I'm supposed to start with, with this question. So I'm just going to let folks speak up to this one um, as the spirit moves you. So this is question number seven on your list uh, for the panelists and for everybody else. And um, the question concerns when district committees look at your online presence. So I'm talking mm -hmm. social media presence, um, website. Uh, to what extent does that um, influence the review of materials at the application stage? I understand at an interview stage that might come in. Does that come in at all at the point of reviewing application materials? For us, at least for me, it doesn't at the application phase. At the application phase, I'm pretty, I'm trying to be as objective as possible based on what they're presenting in their letters and their CV, and so I kind of limited that. And you're looking at so many candidates at that point, you just can't do all the background research on personal things. Um, but certainly when we invite them to campus, and I'm more interested now in your character and your personality, I'm definitely Googling, and I'm going to see kind of how you present yourself, and are there other things that are interesting, partly because I, I want to understand like, who you are as a person. It also helps me connect to you better in our conversation, so it's easier to talk to you. Um, so for me, all that comes after you're kind of narrowed down into a smaller set. I, I never look at social media posts. Um, I, I, I don't Google people. We just do the, the background check to make sure that, you know. You're not your own. Right. Um, uh, so the, the standard right. HR right. things, but um, I never look at social media when, it, when I'm on, I never do, but particularly when I'm on the search committee. I do know that other department members will do those kinds of searches, mm -hmm. and they do have a say when it comes to the final vote. Um, so I would definitely be careful of, about that. But um, it's not—it's not what we don't use it for the initial calling at all. And I personally never look at that. I believe that there should just be a separation. What about if a candidate actually includes that information in their application materials? Mm -hmm. you, then it you, yes. Yeah. Then yeah. You, like if, so if you have um like if you've been working with with students on this really great project and you have like a web page or some kind of social media anti bullying campaign that you're really proud of you know we'll do we'll do that kinds of things but just kind of cyber stalking you is we, we don't really do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, that parallels um, what we do at Durham Tech as well. It's um, you know on, online presence, social media is it's, it's a non-factor in terms of getting down to who, who will be interviewed. And we typically interview at least five. For one history position, we interview ten just because of you know, some unforeseen circumstances. But um, I'll, I'll tell you something you already know. It's out there. Somebody's gonna look. 
And I quite honestly, I mean, unless you hire a professional firm, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I guess I'm just trying to think how, how difficult it would be to manicure your, your online presence. Um, I remember the first time I had somebody give me a link to their web page that was clearly something they developed in graduate school as a way to market themselves. And I was like, okay, well, that's different. I'm old. I didn't do that. <laughs> um, but I do think, uh, for the most part, the social, the, the online presence is, is it's not a non-factor, but it's not, it's not incredibly important. And again, I'm not sure how you can control it, unless you want to direct people to something in specific. Anybody have any follow-up questions about that in particular? I have a question about including a link to a specific project, mm -hmm. research project, mm -hmm. uh, in the CV. So does this is this taken into consideration or? Uh, uh, again, going back to the philosophy search that we just went through, and so then somebody included a link in their cover letter. And again, I was thinking, I'm old. <laughs> but it, it, it was useful, because um, he was talking about some innovative things that he had done, um, bringing uh, uh, students into a project that involved the wider community. And it was really, it was interesting, it was engaging. So yeah, I mean, I do think there's a point. I will say, though, if you're going to do that, give, provide the context, and like be very clear about what it is that you want the search committee to see when they look at that. Um, because it is kind of, when you get into a rhythm, you know, you have a hundred and something applications and you're getting into a rhythm and now somebody wants you to click a link and you click it and flowers pop up and you're like, okay, not that that's what you're, but you know, you, like I, we be very clear about why you are including this extra thing that is an extra step that takes the committee out of their rhythm of, of reading. Yeah, because otherwise I'm assuming that everything I need to know is in the packet, so yeah. I'm, I'm likely to go and look at that stuff in the first phase. Later I will, but not in the first phase. Yes, it's not about that, but um, I wanted to ask maybe Amy specifically, moving from an R1 to a more teaching-oriented institution, I think you referenced that there are like are good resources at Elon to help faculty and faculty develop like their pedagogy or their courses. Um, I guess I was wondering if you'd say more about that, and then if it makes sense if you're coming from an institution like Duke or have less experience, like do you rep is it smart to have done that research and reference that in your teaching statement that you would like draw on those resources to help develop your courses, or is it like don't say that? It doesn't hurt because what you're showing is that you you know who we are and you know that that teaching is, is what we're known for, um, and that you're excited to partner with other faculty and staff around pedagogies and development. Um, so it doesn't, it, it certainly doesn't hurt. In terms of what we have, um, so we have a Center for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning, and they're, um, they're just amazing. Like all they do is learn about teaching and then tell you how to do it and sometimes they'll like come into your class and model it for you and it's I mean it's it's amazing um, and it's done in such a way that you don't feel shame for not knowing it um, it's it's really supportive so you'll have someone come in and um, you know like they'll watch you deliver something and then you know they'll take you out for coffee and they'll say well Here's some things that went well. Here's some things you can improve. Here are the resources to improve it. Here are some people in this department that are doing an excellent job around that. And so it's it's really a community building thing. I will say for new faculty, it is overwhelming because you assume that everybody is a great teacher and you're not. And I spent the first year crying like, oh my god, like, you know, everybody has all this feedback to give me and I'm not a great a great teacher but then you quickly realize no I, it's a it's a, pro a process and everybody is learning and it's it's what we're trying to do um, Elon is also known for engaged in experiential learning so you you get kudos for trying cool stuff in the classroom um, and so that's also really fun and it allows you to try things that may fail miserably, and you talk about it in your unit one, why you tried it, what you were hoping to do, how it connects with some pedagogy, 
and poof, those negative student evaluations go away, and you know, because it's they want you to try different ways to connect with different kinds of learners. Um, so we have um, lots of working groups. Um, we have course development workshops. We have reading groups. Um, we have teaching groups. There's a group of faculty who'll just go around and watch you teach, and then you go to theirs, and then you get to see how different people engage in different spaces and different disciplines. Um, and so if, you, if you're excited about that and you reference really wanting to be a part of a school that is so interested in engaging undergraduates in intellectual activities, then yeah, I would, I would put it in the And just a quick plug, um, Amy, your Center for Teaching and Learning, I think, um, used to do an annual conference in August on oh, still do, still do. Mm -hmm. And it's free. And do graduate students and postdocs can attend? Uh -huh. And they've gone and it's, it's, yeah. I think, um, I think what I want to do now is just kind of open things up to the audience to ask additional questions. What other questions are there? I have a question about, um, for those of you who in your materials um, don't request the teaching university statement, so you really want everything in the cover letter. Um, how much space uh, do you think about then giving the, 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 um, the information that would be in those other documents? Um, which you kind of answered that already, but and how um, how flexible are you on the length of the cover letter? I know there's a lot of emphasis on um, keeping it to two pages, but when they're all combined, it's three. Well, and I think it needs to be really practical when you're putting together these, these packages and just realize that um, hiring committees are, you know, they're, they're faculty members, they're, they're busy people. Um, I think the highest number of applicants we had for a single position was 110. Um, and with an applicant pool that large, somebody takes six pages to get to the point in a cover letter. And I've seen that. Philosophers will read. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I seem to crack on the a philosopher. Um, but no, the point of getting, you, you want to, you know, out of the gate, first page, it's fine if you, you go on a few more pages, but make sure that, that you. You front load everything that, that you think is important. Um, you don't require a, a diversity statement, um, but the reality of our community is it's incredibly diverse in, in all the ways you can find the word. So again, we're just looking for evidence that, that that's an environment that you enjoy and, and thrive in. This is just uh, first, second paragraph. You know, it's, it's like being taught to write an essay when, when you're in high school. What's the thesis statement? Yeah, I'm not reading anything over three pages, I'll be honest. If, if your cover letter, you know, two pages, if your name goes onto the top of the third, anything over that, I'm just, I'm, I'm really not going to be interested in reading more. I think for the same reasons, like, you, you got to kind of be economical. Um, what I think works well is if you can show the integration, right? So if you can talk about your research and how your research informs your teaching and how your teaching supports diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's the gold standard, right? Um, to, to show that, that integration and that synergy. Um, and people can successfully do that in two pages. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> the short gets yeah. to the point, and yeah, I, I like your point about the integration. It just feels like it's more authentic. Also, when it, it comes across, it's very integrated, and to the extent that you can keep it short, mm -hmm. these two. We have letters. Um, you can reach out to. I want to say that you can reach out to. Um, our dean's office to see letters that could not be true. That could not be true. Uh, but I feel like um, I feel like we do have a resource for applying to our university that that tells you like what good letters look like, and it might be on our HR page. I wonder 
wondering if there was anything you learned only once you served on a search committee, or like something that surprised you about the process that you sort of only learned from that perspective. Here's a little thing. Um, but it's, it's really important that the candidates fully answer every question. Our, our, our interviews are, are also pretty to the point, you know, typically they're, they're a couple hours, and that's your window to make an impression, and the set of questions is about 15 long. Um, and I think a lot of Duke graduate students do this, like they've been trained to take notes while you're asking the questions, and so they're sure that they give you a full and complete answer. Um, there's some people who can pull that off without taking notes, which is fine, but um, the people who do that, I mean, they're, they're, they're giving you uh, fuller and more careful answers, and I think it gets back to you know, not wanting to see anything that's sloppy to somebody who takes, takes the questions and the process seriously. I learned how fast it happens. Um, in my mind, before serving on a search committee, everybody thoroughly read and, and agonized over each applicant and envisioned them in that space and then made some grand meta decision about why not. And it doesn't, it happens really quickly. You, you read it and you, you make a decision. And so like you can have hundreds of applicants, but usually the committee can quickly narrow down to 20, 15 or 20. And I, I just, I thought that that was going to be a much more agonizing process until I started on it. And I, and then that's when I realized, oh, you have to be really, sh like, to the point and, and really say, I can do your job and here's the evidence, right? Um, because, yeah, <laughs> it happens very quickly and it's not always because of something that you did say. Sometimes it can be something you didn't say. Um, and so it just, um, but that was a shock for me. Yeah, I guess maybe it's similar, and I think it is. I assume that everyone spent a lot more time going through like the details of your papers, and really, like when people spoke up, it was because they really understood your work. And I think what I'm realizing is that they take kind of the nuggets that stand out, and they build a story based on that. And so some people certainly get into the details, but there are a lot of people who are just taking the pieces that fit with their story and their preconceived notions and they run with it. And so um, that's kind of an unfortunate view of things. But I guess the, the point is that they're not always reading as carefully as you would like. And just to give you a sense of the, you know, the very practical process, our, our committees are typically five or six people, faculty members from the area, administrator, people from, from other campus units. Um, and we don't talk to each other when we first go through the applicant pool. And you know, typically speaking, the committee chair will say, okay, everybody come up with the top five, the second five, the third five. And then you get together and compare. Um, and, and most of the time, every now and then, you know, you'll get together and people will have wildly different impressions, which can give you a headache. <laughs> because um, that means the process is going to take longer. But I would say 90% of the time, and I've been on 18 search committees, I think. 90% of the time, the top five and the, and the second five list are the same people. And that's because for whatever reason, those applicants have made their case directly and effectively, and, and everybody realized that. I mean, I would also say there are many subjective things that come into people's decisions that shouldn't and sometimes we catch ourselves and sometimes we don't. So it's, do we think this person will move to Durham? Mm -hmm. This person is single, they probably wouldn't like Durham. They'd probably rather be in New York. So do we really want to give a spot to someone who probably won't like living here? And then oftentimes like we can catch that and say that's not fair, like block that out, but then still in the back of people's minds you have some of these subjective things going on where people are making judgments about what you will and won't do uh, when they really don't know. Uh, so if there is a, a situation where you know you can speak out and say like you're actively interested in the school for a reason and people wouldn't assume that, I think it's useful to say that. It's usually um, 
At, in ours, we do, we'll have our applicant pool, we'll usually take it down to 10 for Skype and three for the campus visit. Um, so. uh, you know, I, I think we've done a few Skype interviews. Um, I've never been on a committee that used that, and certainly if I was committee chair, I would insist the same person was physically in the room before they were hired. Um, I, I'm assuming, I don't, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, so, so, so we'll... Sky just part of the... The, the narrowing. Right. So we'll, we'll yeah. take our, however many, we'll take our top yeah. ten, we'll Skype with them, and then we'll pick yeah. our top three. It's not common, but yeah, campus. we have done that, and typically we interview five. Okay, that's a lot more. And we are, our field is a bit different in that we have, often some schools will do Skype interviews to narrow, but a lot of schools will also will have a conference where we'll do our narrowing, so we can interview 20 people if we want and narrow it down to a few to the back of campus. Like professional Um, I'm hoping this will be applica applicable to several people in the room. I don't know yet. Um, sometimes I've found with certain opportunities, whether it's like teaching positions or grants or any of these sorts of things, they'll ask for things that aren't really standard in my field. Like, for example, I, so I am in the music department. Most mm -hmm. of what we do is arts performances, is portfolios, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes if students are looking at positions that are like humanities and technology or interdis dis interdisciplinary stuff, sometimes they'll ask for things like a list of publications and like no one, and there's a couple of people who do a bit of publishing in my field and in my major, but it's not this like huge big deal that everybody's working on and if you haven't, it's, and so I'm, I guess I'm not really sure sort of how to deal with that for those types of situations. Do you automatically rule people out if they haven't had publications, but publications isn't part of the field in the per first place? Maybe so not asking it well, could, but. Like at Elon, each department has their own scholarship statement. So what counts as scholarship in music is widely different from what counts as scholarship in, in the Department of History and Geography. Mm. So one of the things that I would recommend is that you reach out to whichever department it is that you're applying to or whichever interdisciplinary program it is and ask for if they have a scholarship statement because that's usually where they will lay out, you know, um, like a recorded performance at Carnegie Hall is scholarship, right? Because that's a professional activity. Um, and, and so you could get a list of what counts as scholarship in, and then use that to frame your response to that scholarship part. Does that make sense? That's really helpful, you? yeah, thank you. Um, and even if, so like even if I were going to apply to an interdisciplinary, for a grant, I might reach out to several departments at different schools and say, what, is, what does scholarship mean in music at UNC? What does, scholarship look like in music at a place like Elon at Durham Tech, right? And then kind of get a sense of the wide variety of what scholarship is and then use that to frame my response for the external grant. Yeah. I have a question about um, connections. Like, I mean, I, I know like someone was applying for jobs and he would try to like contact the select, the selecting committee chair just tell him about them and ask if he should apply. It wasn't really to ask if he should apply, but he wanted to, like, in advance, like, let them know who he is. And there's some people that actually know people more personally, like, on the committee or in the department. And I'm, I'm wondering how big of a factor is, are those connections relative to just the documents? Are you usually just looking at documents and selecting the best candidate based on that, or is it a lot of times a way to do that? I would love to say that it's just about the documents and we're just thinking about the documents, but we do take the, there's, if there's outside information, because someone knows someone's advisor and this person has said that they were both, you know, really good in this particular area, that certainly makes its way in our discussions. And so someone may speak up and say, oh, this person's 
um, statement doesn't really communicate the, the depth at which they've looked at this question, but I've heard from this advisor that they're like one of their best students and they are really, you know, doing a great job in this area. So I would certainly say kind of like there are links there that can kind of come into the phase where people are thinking about decisions and trying to understand whether or not you'd be affected. So I certainly think the subjective piece helps. I also think if you are getting to know people in the field and you've seen them at conferences and you're talking to them and they know you, that also helps them think about your materials a, a bit differently. Um, it, if anything, it just gives more attention, so they'll spend a little bit longer looking at it and kind of looking for reasons to bring you to campus or not. So I think it definitely plays a role, even though I think we try to keep it as objective as possible. I think people are humans and they're taking those cues from other people, whether they know you or they know they trust people that know you. For us, it depends on where you are. Um, like if, if, like if we're a committee of five and you're not on anybody's list, then such and such knowing you doesn't matter. Um, if, if you are kind of on a couple people short list and somebody is willing to speak up for you, then that might help. Um, but yeah, if you, I mean, if you're not on, if you're it, it won't move you from like the cut list to the on the list. Um, and I've, I mean, I've had people reach out to me when I've been serving on committees to do that, that thing. And I mean, it's fine. Honestly, I don't usually remember who they are when they come to the application. Like when I'm starting to review the applications, it's, it's mostly like people that I know from conferences and that I've had more of an interaction with. But if you just call and say, hey, I'm applying for a position at Elon in Michigan, and <laughs> so you're saying it's more later in the process when we get to the interview screen, not the screening phase as much, but the interview phase, like if people know you that's kind of Yeah, because if you're if if you're in a if we're a group of five and you didn't make anybody's list, then you know, a colleague speaking up and saying, Well, I know that person's advisor, then the feedback is gonna be you should tell that person's advisor that that maybe they need to change your application material. It's not going to be, well, now we're going to interview them. It just, it doesn't work that way for us. Yeah, you've got to be in the general yeah. kind of consideration set of people in the room. Mm -hmm. I think that, that, that kind of effort can go sideways. Mm -hmm. I think it can knock you off the list um, if, if the candidate seems pushy and they're calling the chair and it, it, it seems false or like they're trying to curry favor. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had people show up in my office um, and actually ended up hiring one of them. <laughs> but I had to get over that, you know, because, you know, my initial reaction was like, mm, you know, it's, it's this behavior I don't want to see. And it turned out it was just he's kind of an energetic, forward-leaning person. But I had to learn it, so I actually had to get over, you know, the fact that he was contacting me personally. So I would, I would just be careful. If, it, if you're going to make direct contact with anybody involved with the hiring community, I'm just be very careful about it. Go to HR first, probably. I think we've got time for about one more question. Okay, I'm lucky. Uh, so I'm going to ask um, if the applicant from internal within your university or even within the same department, will there be any differences when you judge their like documents or have different criteria for these applicants from your own university? So we won't take you if you're currently a part of the area. So we wouldn't even look at your application. So you couldn't go directly from our PhD program into the faculty position. Um, obviously, I'm someone who left and came back. Um, but I think, you know, I would go in the same pool as anybody else and think about they were looking at the is My advantage is that they know more about me and so they could feel more confident in kind of bringing me out. But generally speaking, we want to look at your vetoes. Do we think you can get tenure here? Do we think you can be a good teacher here? Uh, so the standards, I would say, are similar. And for us, um, it, it, as uncomfortable as it is, we've had part-time faculty apply for full-time positions and not extended on offer, um, gone with an outside candidate, um, and vice versa, you know, we've fallen into an excellent candidate and been like, let's figure out a way to keep this person. Um, I actually went to Elon as a postdoc, 
um, and at the end of my two years, um, they created the position so that I could stay. So it goes it goes both ways, but it's the same it's the same process. Internal can and sometimes being an internal candidate can be a bad thing um, because then you know a lot more about them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yes. So we've. We, but you definitely go into the same pool. I think I talked about how we, we treat our part-time faculty, it, it gives them a leg up. Um, but I was just thinking about the issue of um, research ones hiring people out of their graduate programs. And I was, I was trying to think, I, I know of one incident at Chapel Hill where that happened. And it was, it was a major fight to get that person fired, that fired hired. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I do think um, going straight from graduate school to a teaching position at the same institution, I don't know where that would be coming. I think it's just, I think the rule of thumb is you need to go somewhere else. And the people who wanted to teach at Chapel Hill, who were stars, typically left back when they preferred masters, left at the master's level and got their PhD somewhere else and then tried to go back. Well, thank you all for your terrific questions. I want to share just a couple of logistical notes to wrap up today. Um, one is that there's been a lot of conversation around opportunities to build teaching experiences. And so for uh, the graduate students who are in the room, I want to be sure you know about the certificate in college teaching. And I'm happy to talk to you about that program um, if you want to stick around for a few minutes at the end of today's session. Um, I also want to note that we have two more panels in this three-part series coming up on October 17th. There's a panel on uh, the campus interview. And then coming up on October 29th, we'll wrap it up with a panel discussion on negotiating the job offer. Um, and then we'll also, of course, have continue to have events in the academic job search series um, throughout this academic year. Um, in the spring semester, we'll shift to a focus on all the different kinds of jobs you can have in academia, including non-tenure track faculty positions, um, research positions, and administrative positions. So with that, I'd like to um, thank our panelists today, Dr. Cartwright, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Wong, for joining with us today and sharing their advice. Um, please join me in a round of applause before we move to some one-on-one -on -one questions.